Some people say that EVs are an environmental disaster. An environmental disaster? That sounds serious, doesn't it? Let's consider that, shall we? I think there are largely two concerns regarding the disaster that people foresee. The first is that the quantity of materials used to make the batteries are going to cause an environmental catastrophe because the extraction of those materials is bad. I don't entirely disagree with this point of view. It would be much better if we didn't have to extract raw materials to make EVs. But it's more complex than that. I covered that in some depth in the last video. There'll be a link to that from the end screen of this one if you haven't already seen that. The second area that concerns people is disposal. I've been told several times that EV batteries are going to cause cataclysmic damage when they are piled into landfill in vast quantities. But is that true? These are the two topics we need to cover. I think the place to start in this discussion is the three R's a phrase that we've been made aware of over the last 30 years or more. By that, I mean reduce, reuse and recycle. But perhaps not in the way you think. Not yet. The words themselves are not the only message within this saying. The order of the words is also important, of course. First reduce, then reuse, and then finally recycle. So recycle actually comes last so I'll come back to it later. First, reduce applies to EVs in the way I covered in last week's video. The manufacturing of an EV needs more raw materials up front, but avoids large amounts of fossil fuels being used during its use. Just to reiterate that point, we can do some interesting maths on an internal combustion engine car to work out how much fuel it uses in its lifetime. If you Google the average lifetime mileage of a car, the answer you get most often is 200,000 miles. However, they don't usually quote their sources, and that figure sounded a bit high to me. Fortunately, an infographic developed by Visual Capitalist gives us a clue. They do quote their source, which is a study by IC Cars. However, when you look at that study, you see that it wasn't about average lifespans at all. What they were measuring was actually the longest lived 1% of cars by manufacturer, which is nothing like how you calculate an average. Therefore, in this calculation, I've used the results of a recent study by the London School of Economics, who used MOT test centre data, from which they calculated the lifetime of an ICE car to be 116,000 miles for a petrol car and 160,000 miles for a diesel. The other piece of data we're going to need is the average fuel economy of a car. For this, I went with data from Nimble Fins, who say it's 36 miles per gallon for petrol and 43 miles per gallon for diesel. Remember, this is an average across the entire fleet. We can use these figures, along with the weight of a litre of each fuel, to calculate the weight of fuel used in the car's lifetime. And I think the results are quite interesting. This math shows that an average car uses about 13 tonnes of petrol, or 17 tonnes for a diesel. It's more for a diesel since diesels cover more miles in their life, and the fuel is a little bit heavier. Meanwhile, an EV battery pack contains about 200 kilos of critical minerals, about 0.2 tonnes. Graphite is the largest single constituent, and there's only about 8 kilos each of lithium and cobalt, which are the elements you might have been told are an issue. So that's how reduce applies. Next comes reuse. And this is quite an important part of the current EV battery life cycle that we call second lifing a battery. At the moment, if an EV is scrapped or broken up, perhaps because of an accident, the battery comes out of it and gets sold on. The market is fairly buoyant because there are three sets of potential buyers. The first is people who are upgrading older cars with small batteries into cars with more range. The second are people converting other cars to electric, who often break the pack down into the modules it contains and use those in their own projects. 
The third use for older EV traction batteries is in stationary storage, either for storing renewables or for grid stabilisation, which is dealing with momentary peaks and troughs in demand versus supply. Only if it's not wanted for any of those uses would you need to try to recycle it. Recycling is not a particularly large market at the moment because most EV batteries are being reused, living a happy second life, presumably on a farm. Or is that only pets? Anyway, we can certainly imagine that there will be batteries to recycle or dispose of eventually once the second life market becomes saturated. So will that happen? Is recycling really going to take place? Or will these batteries in fact get dumped into landfill, as some people fear? Recycling lithium-ion batteries is perfectly possible, but it isn't entirely straightforward. There are several techniques used at the moment, one of which involves some nasty chemical processes that result in lots of toxic waste to dispose of, and the other is very energy intensive. So the barrier to recycling might be the cost of doing so either paying for the, the handling of the chemicals in one process or paying for the energy that is needed to complete the second. The question could become whether it is financially beneficial to recycle. What is the cost-benefit analysis? Do we recover enough minerals to make it a net positive from the point of view of cost? After all, if we spent more money doing the recycling than it costs to extract new resources, then manufacturers will just buy virgin materials instead, and we will indeed end up with huge piles of batteries heading for a hole in the ground. Or at least we will if we don't encourage the manufacturers to do the right thing. I mean, we could legislate to ensure that recycling happens anyway. Might that be a thing? Well, here in the UK, we already know that answer for two reasons. Firstly, there's a thing called the Waste Batteries and Accumulators Regulations 2009. If you look at that legislation from 2009, remember, we can see that it's been illegal to throw lithium ion batteries into landfill or burn them since this legislation came into force in January 2010. Weirdly, it's not quite because of the wording you might expect. The legislation details the categories into which batteries fall, as it places different obligations onto manufacturers and importers by category. Here we can see that there is a category called automotive batteries, but EV batteries don't fall into that category, as that's for starter and lighting circuits of ICE cars. However, EVs are specifically mentioned in the industrial batteries category, so we know that this legislation applies. And Regulation 56 states, no person may dispose of waste industrial or automotive batteries in a landfill or by incineration. So in fact, there hasn't been a chance of EV batteries going to landfill since 2010, at least in the UK. That makes me wonder why people mention it. It's funny that. Hmm, never mind. Anyway, if it's already illegal, what's the reality on the ground? What happens to the lithium-ion batteries used in portable devices at the moment? Things like your mobile phone, your laptop, tablet, and the batteries in power tools, for example. Well, until recently, I think we shift them all overseas. Whilst they have been collected via lots of recycling facilities, it appears that nobody in the UK was actually able to deal with them. At least not until October 2023. A company called Recyclus has been granted the first licence to actually recycle lithium-ion batteries in the UK at its Libat facility in Wolverhampton, which they opened in July last year. The licence allows them to process up to 22,000 tonnes of lithium-ion batteries per year, although they have a more reasonable target of 8,300 tonnes for the first year. And this facility can handle all of the lithium ion chemistries, not just a specific one, which is great news. What is more, the EU have just taken another important step to ensure recycling is performed. In July 2023, the EU passed what has been dubbed the Batteries Regulation, due to the fact that the real name is a very long way from being catchy. This brings with it a few very useful requirements. 
The first is that all batteries of two kilos or more must have a QR code that links to an online passport for that battery. That passport will detail their composition and enable tracing of the contents back to their source. The traceability should help ensure that ethical supplies of raw materials were used in their manufacture. And the information on the passport also enhances the ability to recycle them by helping recyclers to identify what chemistry they use and therefore how they should be processed. But there is a second requirement within the new legislation, and that is that manufacturers will be required to meet minimum quantities of recycled materials in their products, with percentage quotas that increase over time. That should help to support the development of a new market for recycling, as people are not just encouraged to perform it, but required to use the materials the new industry outputs if they are to manufacture more batteries. So that all seems pretty good news, at least for Europe. But generally, people are required to play by Europe's rules to sell into the EU, and so that could have an impact on other parts of the world as well. And that's not really all. There could be more good news in the future. You see, when I hear the phrase environmental disaster, I'm reminded of what disasters I've witnessed, albeit remotely. I was an impressionable teenager when news broke on the 24th of March 1989 of an oil tanker running aground on a reef in the waterways of Alaska. This was the Exxon Valdez oil spill. The tanker was carrying 53 million US gallons of crude oil, about 11 million of which was released into the local environment, about 35,000 tonnes. Thick, toxic oil washed up along 1,300 miles of pretty idyllic coastland. News crews brought us pictures of the ensuing impact on local wildlife. It is estimated that the disaster killed up to 250,000 seabirds, 2,800 sea otters and 300 sea lions, amongst others. What I remember finding particularly frustrating about this disaster was the story behind the story. The Exxon Valdez was a single hulled ship. It was suggested that the Carter administration had attempted to mandate double hull designs, which had an extra barrier between sea and oil, over a decade earlier. But that the industry had pushed back and the change had not been enforced. Double hulled ships do not completely remove the dangers of shipping oil. They are still at risk of leaking their cargo in the event of a high energy impact. But the suggestion was that the escape of oil from the Exxon Valdez would have been 60% less if it had been a double hulled ship. After all, the Exxon Valdez seemed to tear open like a tin can, with eight of its 11 tanks breached in the grounding. Indeed, you have to think it's a bit of a miracle that only 20% of the cargo escaped before they unloaded the rest onto another tanker. The 11th of December 2005 was a rude awakening for me, quite literally. I woke to the sound of the house shaking and some glasses in the cabinet rattling. Clearly, there must have been an earthquake. In fact, the Bunsfield oil storage depot outside Hemel Hempstead had just exploded and would continue to burn in one form or another for five days. Not only was I woken by the blast, but I worked at an office over which the smoke trail from the fire would pass for several days. I remember the peculiar sight of a thick streak of black smoke across the sky stretching from horizon to horizon. It was like something from a disaster movie. We were actually quite lucky, as the weather was kind to us. The smoke was held high by a stable temperature inversion and it didn't rain, so we were not affected by the smoke. But it was a pretty unsettling sight, nevertheless. And the third disaster I remember watching unfold was the destruction of the Deepwater Horizon in 2010. This was a drilling rig that was destroyed by fire when a well capping procedure was rushed and went terribly wrong. Not only was the loss of life, but it caused an uncontrolled oil spill for 87 days. I remember watching in astonishment as they tried and failed to stem the flow, 
The safety device on the sea floor, intended to protect against outflow, had failed to shut off. And BP seemed at a loss as to what to do to stop oil gushing into the Gulf of Mexico. In total, it is estimated that 189 million US gallons of oil was released, about 600,000 tonnes. The impact on wildlife as the oil came ashore was pretty devastating. That was the 20th of April 2010, so almost exactly 14 years ago. And the local fishing industry has not recovered to this day. People in the area are also still affected by the adverse health effects of the contamination and the chemical dispersants used at the time. The word dispersant gives you hope, doesn't it, that the oil might go away. Unfortunately, all it seemed to achieve was to make it sink, and a lot of it is probably still there, hanging beneath the water's surface, continuing to impact marine wildlife. That's three of the disasters I remember well, but it's when you go looking, as I did when researching this video, you realise just how many more oil spills there have been. Exxon Valdez, for example, doesn't even make it into the top 10 in terms of the quantity of oil released. Then I found out about the class action lawsuit brought against Texaco for pollution in Ecuador, and I realised just how deep this particular rabbit hole goes. In summary, I completely get why people are nervous about the environmental impacts of the transition to clean energy. Resource extraction is never good, and I wish we didn't have to do it either. But the good news is that the resource usage needed to build EVs will get less over time, unlike ice cars that continue to consume endlessly. Building up a supply of critical minerals, which we will use for a long time, reuse and then recycle, is a sustainable way forward. Whilst we are a bit late to start, recycling of lithium ion batteries is now underway here in the UK and the EU has taken important steps to enable traceability and even greater recycling as well. The switch away from the use of fossil fuels should reduce the environmental impact of those over time, which surely has to be a positive thing. When I think back, most of the environmental disasters I remember were caused by our relentless extraction of fossil fuels. So reducing their use is probably a good approach to protecting the environment. Thanks very much for joining me. I hope you found this interesting. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome in the section below. If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me greatly to achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would subscribe as well. Thanks.